I have a Automatic SL100 AC FP. So it's an AC motor with a foot pedal. Got that going in today. Right now I'm doing all the prep work to get the receiver ready and everything. While I'm doing that, I'm making sure that I've got my area clean and ready to go. This helps me get the operator level and mounted properly so we got the area clean. Still working and as a general principle I want to clean the track off. We don't want any small stones or anything like that on the track, uh, especially when we're first starting this out. I want to get a clean slate. While the gate operator's up here, I went ahead and mounted the receiver and uh, installed it on these uh, side plug terminals over here. Uh, you can see I made a custom cable for it, so it's going to be nice and clean. It'll last the length of the gate operator. At the same time, I removed the uh, loop rack that was down here and uh, just threw it away. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had much success with those loop racks. Now I'm ready to, uh, to start working on the stand and a couple other things before this even goes in. And you can see I've got my box and uh, my cart and uh, hand tools and all my miscellaneous tools with the exception of the welder out ready to go. Uh, the other thing be mounting this on a uh, custom stand it's two and a half inch uh, galvanized uh, so we'll blind mount that we'll take some uh, angle brackets that I got over there and we'll just weld them to the side and uh, weld it to the guide post over there uh, we may put a leg on it let's just see how it goes relocated to the other side of the gate uh, pulled the gate operator over here haven't done any other work to it other than putting this receiver on and putting the lid back on so no dust and debris uh, gets in there unnecessarily um, got to pull my welder out and I've marked where I wanted the leg on the uh, stand so we're gonna weld that and then I'm gonna weld that uh, angle bracket right there to the leg so I can use it uh, to put uh, half inch anchors in just lining it up with the track and checking my clearance so I know where to mount the leg. I just want it uh, kind of even with this. It looks good up there in this corner as well too. I have the leg mounted and uh, the welds are all done and complete. So I'm just going to let it cool down before I paint it. Had it running a little too hot right there and uh, blew a hole in it right there so I had to go back and fill it in. I mocked up the stand. So I could go ahead and just tack weld this uh, angle bracket on here and then I'll flip it over here and weld it now. So I just mocked it up real quick just so I could make sure where I was going to weld it the ground wasn't uh, funky and uh, causing some kind of issue of getting this out of level when I went to weld it to the guide post but um, we're good. Alright I've got the stand built. welds on the top and just kind of a long bead down the side you don't have to go all the way it's probably more than enough right there it's not going to have that much stress in that that uh, plane of the weld so uh, we've got some uh, bright galvanized coating 65% zinc rich so we're going to spray paint this now and um, get the spots where we can't get once we mount it and uh, then we will uh, mount it and start working on the operator. We've got the bottom and the sides spray painted. And we're looking pretty good. Didn't spray paint the top. Because I'll be welding to that and I'll spray paint it after the fact. 
Got the gate operator stand, uh, level, front to back, back to front, left to right, and uh, just have it tacked up there. So now I'll run the gate. Open and closed, just to confirm that we don't hit our stand. See, we got a little bit of bow because you got an inch and a half there, and uh, we got some spots over here that are half inch right there. So um, that's why you double want to double check your clearances and make sure that you got plenty of room, and then it comes back out to about an inch and a quarter right there. Uh, so that is really good. I like the way that that turned out. Uh, it looks clean. So now we're gonna do uh, three welds. We're gonna do a bead all the way from the uh, top to the bottom, left to right, and then top to the bottom on the back side. And then we'll put an anchor in it and that'll make this thing uh, um, very stable. I painted the uh, chain brackets in advance, galvanized. That way when I go to paint the gate, there's not as much overspray because I'm just trying to uh, cover up the welds. So we'll let that dry, and then uh, we're mounting the gate operator now. Then we will uh, we'll mount those brackets. I've got the holes drilled out for the two half-inch anchors I'm about to put in, and I've got it blown out. So we're ready to go there. I've got everything uh, welded down the side back there and I'll go ahead and knock these in put the gate operator on um, and get it lined up tack weld it on there then tack weld the chain brackets got the two anchors in there they went in okay I probably could have gone a half inch deeper but but that's okay, there's good concrete under there, so it fit really well. Um, and that's it. So I'll put the gate operator on and uh, chain brackets. Got the gate operator welded down, ready to go. All four corners there in the back, so I'll go ahead and paint that. This is what the gate frame looks like painted. So it'll blend really nice. One last time, gonna check the spacing between the operator and its proposed location. So sometimes you do this because you want to verify that higher up there's no obstructions and also possibly you just didn't miss anything. So we're good on this. I'm going to go ahead and mount the gate operator right there. And our chain brackets will be long enough to get, get over there. We'll be in good shape. Might be able to even use the factory brackets. Cut the gate operator level. I was actually using a different spot on the board or on the uh, operator to determine whether it was level or not and uh, so this I obviously understand that having it on this plexiglass cover is not the best way to determine whether it's level or not but I was just going to do this for for reference that so we got that level and then we just got a couple of tack welds in the back back there front front and then there's the so now what we'll do is we'll get the uh, chain brackets and I got to pull the factory ones out to see if those would, those had enough length on them um, and we will um, put our test chain up here. We'll take this chain, this is just a six, seven foot piece of chain, we'll wrap it around there 
the knee pad, that's the most important thing. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get it lined up left to right, and then we'll get it lined up up and down. And then once we get that uh, uh, spot where we like it, then we'll um, clamp our chain bracket up there. Take one of those clamps, take the chain bracket. These are the factory ones. We'll see if we have to use these ones or not. And then um, we'll get that actually level, make sure that that's level. And then, um, and then uh, just tack weld that on there. And then do the same thing for the back. Here's a mock-up of the chain bracket. So I'm looking at this angle right here. Looks like it might be a tad low. We'll see. I'll have to take some measurements and, with my, and then look at it with the level. But I'm looking from there, up and down. And then, because I only have a limited amount of space right here, inside here, I need to make sure left and right there's enough room. And... Make sure you change level with the sprocket right there. Or square with it, not level. So I'm looking at the drive sprocket. And then I'm looking at this idler wheel. And I'm making sure those two are in line. And then I'm looking at this. To make sure that the chain is not out of whack left and right. And I would say that that's the most important angle. To make sure you're not getting it left or right at 10 feet out it doesn't matter but when you start to suck the gate all the way back in there like this you start to get uh, tension on the chain and it could possibly wear a little bit faster if you're not uh, if you're not at the proper angle so I'm looking at a couple of lines that I have one of the lines is and it's hard because of the way that the phone is angled is uh, that line on the back of the gate operator. So, um, it looks like I'll be good. Let's see. I might even have a little bit more room than I thought. I'll just use these factory brackets. Now, when you can and, and not, when you can stop using the factory back brackets, is when this piece gets possibly maybe a half inch to three quarter inch further this way um, or actually from the edge so if you start to get half inch or three quarter um, all your strength right here is in this corner it's not in this part right here now the other thing is you can go farther out you just need to weld a gusset off of here just get you a 45 from there to here and um, and that uh, will give you a little bit of strength but it looks like we're pretty good there. May even be able to tap this back in. Get that. I kind of like the chain bolt to be in the center. That way you've got room to left to right, just in case you missed it. All right. I think we're good left to right there. And then now I'll just get this uh, level left to right like that. So we're good, we're nice and level there. And we're good left and right here. And what we got here. All right, yeah, we're good there. All right, now we'll tack weld it. Welded the front chain bracket, so now we've got the back one mocked up. And I'll tack weld it on there and then we'll see how everything looks. Got the back bracket. Weld it on there, ready to go. I am going to weld a gusset on there. So, it gives it a little bit more support. Take one of these square tabs right here. They're quarter inch. I think they're stained, uh, uh, galvanized. Or, and then I'll just weld, uh, weld that right there. But I wanted to clean this up first so I could go ahead and paint behind it. But, I'm just going to add a little bit of gusset right there. And that will help distribute the uh, weight uh, a little bit better between that that corner back there which uh, if you're going all the way to the edge you can get a lot more strength out of it but since I'm not at the edge I, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just do this gusset and just uh, know that it'll it'll work for the life of the gate there's what the gusset looks like it's in the shadow sorry but uh, it's the best I could do so just uh, put it out of 45 
and weld it across and now your leverage is out to here as opposed to here. That'll give you a little bit more support and considering this gate is all R panel, um, it has a bunch of different forces going a bunch of different ways. So this ought to give it uh, enough support. Got the front one welded all the way around now that we're a hundred percent sure that uh, it's level and straight and it's not going to cause any obstructions so I'm going to go ahead and weld the gusset now. Well actually I'm going to spray paint it first. You can see all this water. I just cooled it off and uh, dried it off so uh, now I can put that galvanized paint on there. That will allow me to get the paint back in here. I'm going to weld the gusset over it so I want to be able to get where I just welded painted um, without having to put an like, excess amount of paint on it and, and cosmetically look looking bad. I just paint it now. Now that it's clean and dry I'll, uh, and cool, it's not 100, 200, 300 degrees. Um, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and paint it now and put that gusset on there. I've got the chain laid out and I've got the chain brackets welded and painted. They're done, ready to go. So we'll uh, put our chain on and uh, break off how much we don't need and then put both of our uh, uh, chain bolts on. Here's the chain bolt attached to the chain bracket with approximately 30 foot of chain on there. And I have it going through the drive gear and the idler wheels, wheels right now. And when I put pressure on it, the chain gets about how tight it's gonna be. Maybe one or two more links. Yeah. So now what I'll do is I'll put pressure on it like that and then I'll put pull my chain up to here and then I'll, I'll look at the link relative to the eyelet on the uh, chain bolt and then I'll break that link and then put a master link in there and attach it to this. And then we'll manually open and close the gate once and put the cover on. Once we see that there's 100% no obstructions, the gate operator does not need to be moved, relocated or anything, then we'll go ahead and burn the, uh, and when I say burn, I mean uh, finish welding the gate operator. Right now it's, uh, it's stable and it's not going anywhere. It's got four welds on there and uh, that'll be good uh, for our purposes. And then I'll, I'll just put uh, uh, bigger welds, longer welds and structurally make it more sound. Have the chain installed, have the chain bolts tightened, and I have my limits set. So, take the chain, put it on there, got about an estimate of where it needed to be. Put the gear uh, in uh, uh, where it was locked, and uh, pushed on the gate, pulled the chain, and then I marked where I was going to uh, break the chain. I uh, broke it, I then took the chain off the drive gear, put the chain bolt on, threaded the chain back through the drive gear, and then put, uh, put the chain bolt on and uh, tightened it. It's just a little bit easier that way as opposed to pushing on the gate, like I'm doing now, pushing on the gate, and then trying to get the um, master link on there and get it uh, threaded properly and then get that uh, small solid piece on there because uh, if you don't the weight of the gate will spread those two apart those two prongs of the master link apart and uh, it'll be uh, near impossible to get that uh, that solid piece on there and um, and then get the clip on there so um, with this the alignment of the idler wheel and the sprocket is very very important you can be out a little bit up and down because the chain naturally bends like that but the chain does not bend like that naturally it has just a little bit of flex where it can go left and right and too much uh, over a, a long period of time will just wear and break so we want to make sure that uh, we got our left and right 
and of course in this case we uh, do. But why don't we take a look at it from down here. Let's do the foot pedal release. Take a look at the chain. And then we'll just take a look at it as we're rolling it. It'll be kind of hard to see from this angle, but once we get closer, you'll see how we're looking. See how it's level with the gate, the gate track, level with the gate, level with the idle wheels. And square with it left to right. We're going to swap these power wheels they call power wheels. They're sealed bearing wheels, so they don't, don't uh, uh, not capable of maintaining uh, directly, like these are, where they've got a grease fitting on them, and um, they uh, can have uh, <sighs> lubrication, regular lubrication. So uh, heavier gates will need these sealed bearing wheels. They have a bigger bolt, um, obviously, one solid piece of I guess steel galvanized steel um, and uh, as opposed to these these six inch wheels they're cast so the weight rating is lower and uh, they need to be maintained so we're gonna take these six inches off and put these six inches on and remember the bigger the diameter and typically it's four and six inch so the bigger diameter the easier it is to roll have to drill a little bit bigger holes and get a different setup because it's bigger nuts and um, and bolts and uh, and then we'll uh, mount these in uh, where these uh, cast iron wheels are had to drill out the hole to get the uh, power wheel bolt through there and you definitely want to use the power bolt wheel uh, bolt if you can because it's the same size as the inside of the wheel obviously why it comes with it but the other thing is is because it's so tight it allows the bearing to spin on itself as opposed to on the bolt and you want it to spin on itself now these boxes are a little bit bigger than they um, are made for these wheels because the wheel is supposed to just barely fit in there but you can see that there's some some slop in there and that's just that's just what we got but the bearing is rolling on itself and not on the bolt which is good so i'm going to take this piece of steel right here and i'm going to cut it to length and i'm going to weld it on the edge of this uh post weld it right there and then uh, that's what's going to have the receiver head uh for the double head photo i i think it's a e it's an emx irb MON with the uh, the gold covers. So this is what our uh, transmitter, if you will, uh, looks like for our photo eye. Now this is going to be mounted on the other side, but this kind of gives you an idea of, of what it's going to look like. I'm going to mount it on that plate right there and run the wire from the track down here over to this post and then up behind that two by two I have sticking out. You can see I've got that painted and welded around the sides of bottom. And then I just welded welded this on there. I just put a couple of welds on the back, uh, top and bottom. So I'll let that cool down and then I'll paint it. That's what it looks like painted. One of the things I have to do is run the wire from the gate operator over to the receive head of the photo eye, which is going to be mounted right here. And there's a conduit that has been pre-installed underneath the driveway. And it's coming out right there. But as you can see, they didn't tape off the uh, tape on that. Looks like they attempted to tape off the the uh, conduit at the end, so no dirt we get in it. So, as a precaution, what we're going to do is we're going to blow out one of them. That's going to be a really tough pull. We may have to actually uh, back off the fitting up here 
because you see you've got a 90 and then going into another 90 right off the bat and that's going to be really tough to pull through the good news is it's three quarter inch bad news is is three quarter inch metallic so uh that uh doesn't make for a very easy pull so we'll blow these out and uh, that'll get some of the dirt out and then we'll put a fitting uh well we won't put any fitting first we'll pull the wire first and then we'll worry about our fittings and the conduit down there now uh, a tip for doing conduit the seal tight in cold weather get your conduit out and get it straightened out right i've just got it i've just got it rigged up like this in the truck and then i've got it set setting in the sun what that'll do is make this conduit more malleable and you can bend it the way that you need to as opposed to uh, just pulling it right out of the factory plastic wrap like this um, it's kind of hard to uh, get it straight when it's like that but setting it in the sun and then straightening it out will help so we'll blow this out right now and let's see what it looks like on the other side so we can see that we went from dirt in the conduit to no dirt we're gonna have to uh, go from three quarter inch down to half inch and then we'll have to make these bends which is why we want to pull the wire first so I'm gonna go ahead and put the fish tape through this side over here I think it's gonna be the easiest for me to start on this side now I would typically use a metal fish tape but I only have a fiberglass we've broken two metal fish tapes in just as many months so um, it uh, it uh, should do the trick, and I'll, I'll give you a couple tips on doing it with this where you don't have anything on the other end. I was able to get the fish tape through pretty smoothly. See, it's coming out of that conduit right there, and then I've got it over to here. Uh, I'll have to clean out around that conduit and get that tape off there. And uh, to be able to put my glue and my fitting on there, worry about that here in a second. So I've got the wire. In, on the spool setup, one of the trick with these you don't want the wire um, same thing with the uh, s seal tight that I uh, showed you earlier you don't want it uh, to where it has uh, bends in it and one way to make sure that it rolls out straight is to put it on the ground like this and either pull it out and pull it off the spool or if you don't have it set up to where you can easily do that, which I don't, this is only a 30 foot pull, so I'm not gonna set it up on a rack to where I can easily pull it off. Uh, what are the, uh, one of the things you don't wanna do is you don't wanna pull it off like this. Because when you do that, it's gonna be just like that. It's gonna have those kinks in there. We want it as straight as possible. The easy way for you to do it when you're only doing these short runs, or if you don't have a rack to set up, is just push it off like this. Now this is direct burial wire, so the exterior jacket's pretty durable. That's why I'm not hesitating to actually use my boot to push it off like that. It's not damaging the wire uh, because it's not piercing the jacket on the outside of the cable. We'll do one more little spool like that. You see how it's wrinkling up like that? That's what we don't want. So we can straighten that out here in a minute. We'll go ahead and do more than what we need so when we get to pulling the wire we don't have to go through this again all right now we'll just take this spool and bend with our knees put it down here on the ground and we'll pull it out and then we'll just uh whip it around a little bit to try to get all those loops out of it. We're twisting it and putting tension on it at the same time. So that's probably a lot more than what we need. That's okay. We've got to be able to make splices and so on. So now I'll just walk it back. and set it down right next to the uh, fish tape. So now I can prep it and I'll show you how to do that here in a second. But uh, this is the way to do it when you're by yourself, is to pull that wire out 
And if you're pulling a long run, maybe over 50 feet, you can take the middle of the wire, grab it right there, and then pull it down to right here. And the benefit of that is, is you're only pulling, in this case, 25, 30 feet at a time. You're not pulling the whole wire with all of that weight on there if you were to pull this down to the middle. So I've got it broke halfway, so when I'm pulling it, I'm not pulling this part of the wire as well too. I'm only pulling just a little bit and this full length of it. So it's not as much weight on the, uh, on the joint right here that I'm about to make. Here's the stages of the cable prep that I went through to uh, get it ready to pull off of this fish tape. So I took the jacket. First thing I did was cut anything that had a crazy bend on it like this. At the end of the cable, I cut that off and that left me with the straight cable. Then I took it and I scored it. Scored it. And then I, and then I pulled that jacket off. And then I took the, pull, the rip cord and ripped the insulation all the way down to there. And then that left me with uh, the inner wires with their different colored insulation, the shield, uh, and uh, what's left over with the, uh, the uh, uh, cable jacket. Now we're left with this right here. And I've got one wire. I cut three of the wires off. I cut the jacket off. I cut the uh, shield off and the, the shield wire, cut those all off, and then uh, I'm in the process of making this clean so it'll be easy pull. And then now we're gonna prep it to go onto the fish tape and pull it through. And here's the end result. What I did is I took that orange cable, the orange wire that was out of the cable, and I taped the very end first. I just taped this. And then I took the cable and spun it around the fish tape like this, and then taped the very end down here. And then I came back down here and then ran tape, electrical tape, just standard electrical tape, all the way up. Now normally this orange part wouldn't be exposed here and there, but I just wanted to show it to you so you could see the idea behind this. And then now when I'm pulling on it, that tension uh, around the twist is what's gonna keep this thing from slipping off. And that's the goal of us doing this. We don't want it to slip off halfway through. Then we gotta pull the wire back out and then pull the fish tape and push it back down through. So uh, I'll finish taping this up right there, but hopefully you got the concept of what you need to do. You need to make sure that you don't nick any of those cables any of the wires inside the cable so you have a good strong wire to pull from. You pull it, you're gonna pull an extra five or six feet out of it and then cut it off and then that way you know that there's not a, a, a wire that's in there that has been pulled with too much tension on it, possibly damaging the actual wire itself. But um, we'll get to that stage here in a second. I'll finish taping this up and then I'll pull it through. I finished taping it. Now I'm gonna go over here to the other side and pull it. Now it might get caught on that first part when it uh, is taped up, but I think we got a good angle on it to where we can get past it. I'm wrong. Uh, see, we're pulling dirt in there too, so that's uh, gonna be causing a little bit of an issue. I'll blow it out one more time. So we don't pull, oh, no, it's actually getting caught there on it. So now, as you can see, I'm pulling it straight. I'm not pulling it at any angle. I'm pulling it straight right along with how I'm pulling it. If I were to have the wire out here, it would have to make that bend and then come in there. That's not what I want. So I'm gonna blow this out one more time. See if we can get any of the air. It's gonna be hard to see. It did blow some of it out. So now that we're past that one little hump, let's see how it pulls. Looks like it's pulling pretty good. That's probably pulling dirt in there. All right, now here's the tricky part. I'm gonna take it nice and slow. There we go. All right, no water in there. That's a good thing. Well, it's a good thing in one aspect and it's a bad thing in another. 
uh, for this particular wire because it's a drag burial wire. It's made to be without conduit inside the dirt and it has a, a rating specifically for that. And most of these drag burial cables will have a UV rating too so they can actually be sitting on top of roof and UVs won't damage the jacket, therefore damaging the wire, uh, causing you problems with your connection. Uh, the water in there actually can be a good lubricant, but it can also make it harder to pull because you're trying to grab onto something as you're pulling. It looks like we're through there, so I'm gonna pull way more than we need. I'm gonna pull about 15 feet more than we need. There's a reason for that. So we have all that excess. I'm gonna pull just another couple feet, just for the fun of it. Now I'm gonna blow the conduit out one more time. All right. Now we'll cut the uh, cable off of the fish tape, take all this tape off um, up to a certain point, up to about here, and then we'll spool this back up. That should be the only wire pull that we have for the day. And the reason why I'm leaving a little bit of this actually on there is because these older fish tapes, the head breaks off, and when you go to retract it, you can actually pull the fish tape back in there, and then it's pretty much done for. It's a pain in the butt to open these and try to, to re-spool them. I've never seen it done successfully. So if you leave a little bit on the fish tape, you'll prevent it from uh, sucking back in there. Getting the cable prepped over here on the uh, gate operator side of the drive, and I'll show you what I got. I've got conduit with a 90 degree fitting on it going underneath the track into the gate operator that sits right here so it's a three foot wire run from this box over to the gate operator i drilled a half inch approximately half inch hole there i fed the wire through the nut for the 90 degree fitting um, i'll mount those in a second and um, uh, i'll uh, have the wire that comes out here but what I'm gonna do before I make that connection is actually feed the wire through here first as opposed to um, putting the uh, fitting on the back of the wire uh, uh, or on the back of the connector and then feeding the wire through there if I do it like this where I feed the cable through this hole on this side and then feed it into here. I've got a little bit more flexibility because I can move the fitting around if I need it. And if I need to bang it on something to help feed the wire, I can. And then if I need to just back this connector connector off altogether and then just feed it through the connector first and then through, feed it through the conduit, I will. Um, now on this side, it wouldn't be uncommon for you to just leave it bare like that, which is how I'm gonna have to do it. The other thing is, is if you by chance have a knockout to where you can put that in there you could put another connector on there but what we'll do is we'll feed it up underneath the gate operator and then possibly feed it through that wire right or through that hole right there or just zip tie it to uh, possibly the uh, the foot pedal and um, and let the wire just go up through here and then into the box through here to make our connections there um, the uh, the other thing is too, is in this scenario, we're gonna to have to uh, run power to the photo wise separately. So the device that we're connecting, we probably wouldn't be able to make a junction in the box or a, or, or a, or a connection on the box because we still need to run that wire down here to power. Um, if it had more than one hole in it, you could possibly just run the cable up to here and then the wiring back down to the, to the uh, power supply. And I keep pointing over here is because the power supply is going to be connected to that outlet right there. So um, that'll also possibly help you uh, understand why I'm running more cable in this than just up to here plus a little bit to strip it back. And the reason is, is yeah, I have that much extra, but then I need to take, you know, another two feet and run it back down to the uh, power outlet. That joint right there is completed. Uh, you can see I didn't leave much service, which I'm not concerned about. It's an easy wire pull. Um, and uh, I, I just don't uh, need, uh, you know, six inches of service when I can leave all the service over here. Now, before I mentioned that this one was going to actually have to come up to the control box and mount, that's not true. I, I, I forgot. I, mean, I just got ahead of myself. This one is just going to power. So as long as we have it powered, we're good. It doesn't need to actually send signal either. So this one, and this is the reason why I cut the, uh, 
conduit off another six inches. This one is just going to go back over here and we'll just zip tie it over there so it's uh, nice and secure. We'll strip it back uh, a good, uh, uh, you know, six to eight inches and uh, just pull two wires and then connect it to the to the uh, transformer that we're going to plug in over here. So we'll uh, we'll do that later. Um, just a, a, a quick mention on getting those lock nuts, getting the uh, uh, nuts for the fittings on there. Um, I used the, this tool to, to get it done. This is, uh, I think, a Greenlee nut tightener, and uh, it's very uncommon that I have to use this. Most of the stuff you can just knock out with a screwdriver and, uh, and a hammer uh, to get it tightened on there, but this is a perfect scenario for it because, as you can see, it's kind of behind everything and hard to get to, so it made it pretty easy for me to just put it on there and, uh, and tighten it down. And now we'll go to the other side. So here's the fitting that we're going to use to take this three-quarter inch down to half inch. So it's a three-quarter inch female to female coupling, and then it's a half inch female to threaded coupling. And then we'll take this half inch uh, 90 and we'll put it on the end of here. And we probably should do that first. We'll feed the wire through it and then uh, we'll, we'll put this on there. That'll allow us to just glue it on there right there without having to twist this on afterwards. And then you can see I got a screwdriver down there for spacing. For when I go to put it on, I'll use that for spacing so I can get the fitting on. And I've cleaned out underneath the conduit and uh, blown it out a couple times just to make sure that there's no dirt in there that uh, could or rocks that could cause issues in the future if they have to re-pull it so it's a little bit overkill but uh, just better be safe than sorry so we'll uh, go ahead and uh, do the fitting now that's what it looks like glue put glue in uh, let's see if you get better in. put glue in back here and uh, glue, this was already glued together. And then this I just twisted on because it was a, uh, a male to a female. And then you can see I've tilted it at an angle and there'll be a little bit of flexibility in there to where I can, uh, I can move it a little bit, but I don't want to break that glue. Um, so I'm really happy with that. And then this is tilted to the angle to where we'll go underneath the fence over here. And we'll take that seal tight connection. Um, we'll probably uh, screw a couple of straps there and then a couple straps to the back or zip tie depending upon. Now the seal tight is connected and on. The wire is ran through there so you can see that obviously I have more than what I need but uh, you know I've got to make a couple of bends and you never know exactly how things are going to go. You could start screwing into something and it not be stable so you may have to rethink your plan. So I, uh, I've just left that excess until I'm 100% sure what I'm gonna do. And then that's gonna all be determined on how I mount the, uh, the photo eye head up here. I'm gonna mount the head for the receive side on uh, the latch part of the gate. And I have marked my holes right here on the plate that we're gonna mount it to. And then now, then I'm going to drill it out, and then that'll give me these uh, uh, screws that I can actually run through this hole right here and screw it to. So, and I've got some washers on the back that'll uh, help uh, keep it stable. And then I used my punch after I marked my holes. I used my punch to get a little divot in there, so I'm on center when I drill my holes. There she's mounted. And uh, just in case you didn't catch this, I put this particular fitting on there for a reason, as opposed to where the one where you take the conduit and twist it on. And the reason being is I'm not going to be able to twist it without bending it and, and having it hard to, uh, to, um, to anchor down. So this one you can just push in and then you tighten it down without having to actually twist it on there. So that's what she looks like. As you can see, I just used two um, bolts, one on the bottom of one side and then one on the top of the other. And another thing that you may have noticed as well too is there's no circuit board in there and it's just a precautionary measure. Uh, take it out just so you don't scratch it, bent it, dent it, 
whatever uh, to really ruin your day when you uh, damage one of those control boards. So now I can just uh, slip that in there. I blow this out first, get all this little debris from uh, drilling the hole out. I'll get all that debris out, blow it out, and then I'll put the circuit board in there and then I can put the cover on there uh, after I wire it up. Conduits ran up to the box, strapped on there. Unfortunately, I had to work with what I had here. They weren't sure whether this part of the fence was gonna stay. So I left enough slack for if it does stay, we're good. And if it doesn't, then then uh, you just be able to throw another strap on there. And that's how the bottom looks. Just was able to push it in there and we were good to go. Now I've got this excess wire here. I'll cut it off to probably, you know, about a good 12, 18 inches, strip it back or cut it to here strip it back a couple inches and then pull the rip cord all the way down to the bottom and that'll give me exposed two wires. You'll probably just use the black and red since it's power, exposed two wires and then allow me to make that uh, make that connection there. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and fill in the dirt back in this uh, hole right now. I left a couple of the, the two wires over there spare this orange and blue and I got the black and red tied into power. Now I'm just going to go ahead and mount the cover. And we'll start working on the transmitter side now or the master side, however you want to call it. But uh, I am not hooking up the shield on purpose. You want the shield to always tie to one common point. You want to remove excess energy, not add to it. And if you do grounds at two different, or in this case, a shield at two different points, you could uh, potentially create voltage as opposed to reduce voltage, which is what we're trying to do. Um, okay, I've got the, uh, the hole filled back in over there and the conduit turned out really clean. I'm not gonna take a chance. I'm gonna go ahead and put the uh, anodized hood on and that'll help. Uh, block some of the sun from the uh, sensor. They make another cover that can go inside the sensor, but I don't think we're quite there yet. We're going to mount the, or actually already have mounted the, uh, the housing and the hood for the transmitter side, uh, what I'm going to call the master side of the uh, safety photo eye. Um, the housing was pretty simple to mount. I just uh, took a, a, a long skinny drill bit and uh, just marked it um, just by squeezing the cordless drill gun a little bit uh, here and here. And then I just got a caddy corner and two are, are probably sufficient. I use these uh, number 10 or number eight rather self tappers, the Phillips head, uh, inch and a half long. I think an inch would probably got it done, but uh, I just needed, I wanted to make sure uh, because the uh, housing obviously stops somewhere back in here and uh, you just need a little bit of length. But uh, we'll mount strap here and then we'll mount a strap here that covers the coaxial cable for the um, long range antenna kit. That will be the uh, head side the transmitter side and then we just got a few more things programming remotes and uh, testing the gate operator out and that'll be it. The conduits anchored down and I have an 18-4 uh, direct burial wire pulled and I have zip tied the conduit down here to the bottom of the electrical so we're not really worried about any interference we just got power and a relay so no data or anything that uh, could be corrupted by the electromagnetic field that the uh, 120 volts puts out. So we're not really worried about that. Um, behind it, right there, I'm not sure you can see it all, well, all that well, but that is coming from the receive side down there. And the receive side is just gonna have power, so it's just gonna have two conductors. So you can see that uh, this one's not that long, but this wire that's coming out for the uh, transmit side just keeps going and going and going and uh, I left it long because I actually have to get up there so I have to get all the way up there with one pair of wires and then I'm only going to the outlet with another pair so uh, that's why it's a little bit longer but we'll cut off what we don't need and um, 
and that's it. So you could see what I was talking about earlier when the hole that uh, has the coaxial cable that's uh, uh, drilled down here at the bottom is going to be covered by the conduit. So that's what I was talking about. So yeah, it's a pretty big hole and you need that in order to uh, get the uh, actual uh, F connector through there but uh, it's now covered so you know when you're standing six feet away you're not going to be able to notice it and then we've got our conduit nice and straight there ready to go so now we'll uh, uh, strip this wire back and we'll make uh, uh, some bare copper exposed here and then we'll put the uh, the actual uh, printed circuit board in here and then we'll make our connections here in the uh, housing so we're going to do a power power transformer here and I believe I have 24 volt AC power transformer we're hooking this up what EMX calls configuration zero so it's a normally closed relay and uh, I believe they recommend 24 volts AC for that so I've got my transformer here and then we'll wire normally closed and common up here in the circuit board the wires been prepped this uh, orange and blue is going to go up to the control housing so it'll get fed up through a series of these holes right here and go up through the control housing. Uh, the red and black is going to feed for our power, so it's going to go right here to the transformer. And then you can see I've got these stripped back, stripped back, and they're going to go in uh, in the bottom of the receiver uh, where the or transmitter where the uh, uh, terminal connectors are. So they're prepped and ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and mount them to the circuit board, and then I'm going to pull the excess wire from here down and then it'll seat just right when I get, when it gets down in there it'll seat just perfectly I may have to loosen up this uh, strap right here in order to do it comfortably I don't want to pull on the wire too hard because I, I may get to a, a smooth spot and then while I'm pulling on the wire it pulls and possibly damages the circuit board so we don't want to do that transformer has the wires connected to it now I use these blue spade uh, well, I guess they're ring uh, solderless terminal connector and I took both wires and spun them together uh, twisted them together and put the, inserted them and then crimped them with the proper crimper so uh, the the thing about these when you use these and you're going to use more than one wire twist the wires together because it creates a cross section that adds resistance to the connector and it makes it a lot tougher to uh, to pull out of the actual connector, even, even if it's not crimped properly, it uh, adds resistance to it. So uh, the second thing is, is you can see that it has this center lug, so you can actually screw it into this duplex outlet. Um, you just put the cover on first and then screw it in. And you can see that I've got the wire connected to the circuit board. This is one way to do it. It makes it a little bit easier if you take the circuit board out and then wire it and then put it back in. So we'll pull the excess wire out and then get it to where it's kind of close in there and then we'll screw it in there. Made a little mistake when I went to wire up the photo eye, I wired it to uh, safety and that was great for the safety but it doesn't solve the new UL325 uh, connections that they actually have on the board so uh, I'll show you it here in a second but we'll just start from here what I had to do um, I had to take the power off of this AC transformer and connect it to now an extension that goes up to the top through this hole and then through here over here to the monitored 24 volt so uh, the, the now the transmitter if you will I'm calling transmitter master however you want to call it uh, the the side with the relay on it is now being powered off of this 24 volt and not 24 volt DC and not this 24 volt AC down here and um, what I forgot was what the uh, control board does is actually flashes power um, on this uh, common and 24 volts and looks for a change of state in the relay. If the relay does not change state, then it knows that it's not being powered directly through this and it'll sense a fault. If it does change state, then it knows that it's giving power, 
taking away power and then giving power back again and it'll see the change in the state of the relay. So in this case, um, I had it wired to safety and had it powered off of something else, not thinking about the UL325 at all. Then I realized, oh crud, I gotta get uh, over to the um, monitor close because I was showing a monitor close fault. So uh, connecting that power now and, and, and making a jumper, uh, from down here where the wires were connected to uh, up here where it's going to be powered, where it is powered now because the gate operator is working. I took these uh, B connectors and this is a insulation displacement connector and what it does is it uh, uh, allows you to put wires in it without stripping it even though you see I've stripped it here, strip it and then it has little teeth in there and those little teeth displace the insulation. That's why they call it an insulation displacement connector. And uh, they puncture the insulation or the dielectric right here. And, and then uh, that allows the two conductors, because they're both being placed in the same con uh, uh, connector, allows them to be electrically the same. So I left these like this just so you could see. Well, one, I've modified this uh, B connector to where I've cut the bottom off just a little bit. That way I can get two heavier gauge wires in there. I stripped the wires back, twisted them together, and then I put the uh, 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 B connector on there and then I crimped it from top down to the bottom. That way the gel, oh that's one thing I didn't mention, is it has gel in there. Um, a lot of people would say well it has silicone in there. It could be silicone but a lot of silicone contains ammonia and ammonia will uh, oxidize copper. So uh, it's, it's most likely not a silicone, even though it could be, but they call it a gel. So I would imagine that it's not. So that's the stages of it. We strip the wire back, we expose the conductors and then we twist them together. And then we put the uh, B connector on there and then crimp it together. Uh, it makes, a, in my opinion, a better connection by doing this, but it does add a step which is what insulation detector displacement connectors are supposed to do. It's supposed to take away that step, but we do it so we can have a, a better joint and uh, more resistance on there if the wire gets pulled and, and tries to come out of the connector. Uh, so we had a couple more remotes to program. We programmed those. I'm gonna go ahead and make this connection right here, and then we're gonna run the gate open and close. Mounting the antenna, uh, here's the the way that it looks from up here, uh, you drill inch, inch and a quarter hole, run the coax cable through it, and then if you want, you can mount the bracket over the hole a little bit. That way it kind of covers it up. But if you do it on a side that's not visible by most people, then not that big of a deal, but uh, I like to cover it up. And then we've got uh, Antenna on top of that, tighten down the connection, make sure that the antenna actually is in the female to female coupler. Uh, that is, uh, has been uh, an issue that I've seen before. You get the technician that just uh, put the cable or put the uh, uh, actual conductor for the antenna on there and then screw it down. Well, what happens is it gets pushed up um, out of there just by the force because some of the manufacturers, they don't do the, the proper uh, glue adhesive on here. So it pops up a little bit um, or pops up a lot to where it's actually just resting on the very top. You can't see it from here, but resting on the very top of the connector and actually not making a good contact. What we want to do is push the conductor all the way down into the female to female connector so it makes a good, uh, good connection. And uh, it looks like this one still actually had a little bit to go, but it's as far down in there as it can go. And then this sleeve, I'm not sure if this sleeve all, all helps all that much, but we put it on there anyway, uh, push it down to keep, uh, keep water out of where the, uh, between the antenna and the uh, adhesive. But uh, that's the proper way to run the antenna. Now the cool thing about it is cosmetically, that's all your customer sees, right? And then down here at the bottom, when I mount my photo eye, I'll, be, I'll run conduit down the photo eye and over to here and it'll cover up this hole right here. So all you'll see is the conduit for the uh, photo eye and not, uh, and not the antenna. And that's the, the reason for the location that it is right now, which is just below where the uh, housing 
mounts to the uh, where the gate frame mounts to the guide post and the housing sits on top of it. It's right below that because the conduit is going to go right over it. So you really won't even see that hole um, at all. So, so that's how it looks. That's the way it should be done. Keep in mind, that's cosmetic. Sometimes we have to go on the outside of the post. Sometimes we have to go down the brick wall and you want to make that look clean too. But the reason why that's done right there is strictly cosmetics. We installed the uh, UL325 warning signs. Now, uh, when you're doing that, there's, there's a couple of guidelines for installing it. But basically from the secure side and the unsecure side, so the secure side would be inside the property where the employees' vehicles and the residents live and so on. The secure side, you want it mounted to where they can see it. The unsecure side, you want to mount it where they can see it. So if I were to mount this, see how I have it here mounted on the gate on the inside of the property? If I were to mount that same thing on the inside of the gate here, or on the outside of the gate, you wouldn't be able to see it because the gate would be closed or open rather a part of the time. So you need to mount that to where they can see it all of the time. So be cautious when you're mounting the gate, or excuse me, when you're mounting the signs because they might not be able to see it um, all of the time. So you wanna mount it in a location to where when the gates open or close, they can see the, the signage and um, it's very important to do that. Actually so important, it wouldn't be a bad practice to do that first thing. Because even though the gate doesn't have power or may not be installed all the way, the gate may not have the proper safety devices and may be under control of a keypad or a remote that you don't have physically in your hands and somebody could accidentally lay their purse down on the remote button and accidentally open the gate. Because even though this doesn't have any safety devices hooked up to it as of yet, if it were in the closed position and somebody to, were to give it a command, it would open that, actually open up. So that's something to just be very cautious of is that uh, the signage, don't. it wouldn't be a bad habit to get into just mounting it first. So we mounted those, I believe, on the first day um, when we still had our stand and all that stuff uh, uh, put in. So just be very cautious of mounting signs. Um, you obviously, your gate operator having uh, stickers on them as well too wouldn't hurt. Like this one does, it has uh, the uh, uh, UL325 smaller version of the UL325 on sign on the side. We've had a qualified technician run the power. You can see the conduit coming in underneath the track and then um, there it's been extended a little bit to get into the box. And we've got uh, a little bit of high voltage here. Something that I've made the uh, owners aware of. It seems like uh, several circuits inside the building actually have high voltage, well, higher than what we would like to see. So on uh, incoming voltage for a AC line, 5% over what it's rated at is probably okay. So 126 volts and so it's a little bit lower than it was yesterday when we tested it. Yesterday when we tested it, it was 127 volts. So it's probably fair to say that that's acceptable. Um, you check with a qualified electrician and they can tell you um, what the uh, downsides are to having uh, high power, uh, or high voltage rather, higher than what it's spec'd at. So take the electricians brought us power. We've tested it. We've tested that uh, we have a good ground and um, we've tested our, our voltage and documented it, and now we've got power and we can start testing the equipment. Now, I've already ran it one time, uh, just a couple of feet, so I have, this will be the first time that I've ran it all the way, so let's see what the, uh, what the gate operator does. So I've cleared the area, there's no personnel. I've marked the area with orange cones, so people know uh, that uh, work is being done. I'm gonna run it for the first time. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check the safety device. Okay, the non-contact sensor works. Now I'm gonna go ahead and close it again. I'm listening and watching all at the same time. I wanna to listen to see if there's any rubbing, cracking, any noises that would not be uh, normal. And now I'm gonna come down here and, and see uh, 
and see where she sets. Now, because I know I've already set the limits, um, I don't have to be as cautious about monitoring the gate these first couple of cycles. Ideally, what you would probably want to do in this scenario is actually monitor the gate operator while you're close to the on-off switch. That way, if something does act um, um, erratic, you can immediately stop the gate operator. So we'll go ahead and uh, click it again. We'll give it an open command. We've got uh, the gate operator opening. We again want to check the safety device while the gate operator is opening to make sure that we have um, uh, the direction set properly. In this case we do. We have it set open left and it is an open left gate. That, uh, that's something to be cautious of because if you have multiple safety devices, you test it one direction, it may work just fine, then you test it in the other direction and it could quite possibly do an action that you don't want. So, I'm gonna let it run. Now that we know that it hits the stop limit before hitting the catch. That's pretty good. I'm going to back it off to where it doesn't close as far. And you do that by releasing this plate. And in this case, we're going to spin it towards the switch. We're just going to go one notch, okay? And it's not uncommon for the uh, limit nut that you're not adjusting to get out of position. So you just push it back over to where it slides in the slot and then both of them should seat just like that. So now we'll turn it back on. We'll give it a command, it should open up. And because we have the gate set to open, stop, close, I'll give it another command. The gate will stop and then I'll give it a close command. And then we should get about a half inch to an inch uh, backed off. Okay, so we got about half inch, three quarters of an inch. I'm really happy with that. Now, they're gonna discontinue the use of the lock um, when, uh, when this all gets sets up, set up. That was for the manual setup. The final step is to review everything with the customer, the safety features. Uh, inherent safety features built into the gate operator, the non-contact sensors, and uh, how they react. You review the manual release. You review if there are any user serviceable parts inside, how to maintain it, what they need to maintain, what they can do uh, themselves, um, what devices they can't do themselves, um, basic maintenance in and around the gate operator and, and um, just the basic operations of it. So I went over that with my customer. I went over about 15 minutes. There are some safety things that you wanna go over with your customer. Basically, you need to talk to them and read that to them right in front of them, okay? And let them know that you have signage up saying specifically that, that these gates can kill you. Uh, we're, we're here in, in Texas and unfortunately had a little boy pass away uh, who was playing around the gate at a neighbor's house and um, it's just a, a tragedy that doesn't need to happen. But you have to be cautious about this. You have to make your customer aware that we're possibly not um, telling, we're, we're, we're telling them this information for more than just themselves. We're telling it for people who we don't know are ever going to be on the property. If you have a commercial property like this is, they got people who coming in to buy stuff from them and they don't, they don't know who these people are. They could have uh, uh, people with kids or people that are stressed out, not thinking about it. And they walk right into uh, a problem situation and you saw me do it earlier. And I'll, I'll, I'll throw that up there now to see if there is uh, any alignment issues with the gate. If you didn't install the gate, you, you may be concerned with that. Now, I'm in a real dangerous position and I'm gonna get out of it as quick as I can. I went back here behind this gate operator 
without turning the gate off because I heard something. So you can get in a, in a bad position back there if you're not paying attention, and that's exactly what happened is I wasn't paying attention, so you gotta be very careful. Now, it's important to know that I made a mistake doing that, but it's also important to know that it's not getting edited out. I, I need to show you that information in order to uh, allow you not to make that same mistake. I caught it, but it's possible to, to uh, have an accident happen before you catch it. So that's why I left that in there because you need to know. Now the other important part about that as well too is you have to keep in mind, you have to have to keep in mind, you're not the only one using this gate. You saw me do it earlier when I walked back here with the gate operator on. This is a great pinch point and you could, you could be in some serious trouble if you walk back here with the gate operator on. Now the good thing is, is we have an inherent safety device on the gate operator, but it's set to the sensitivity for something pretty hard to hit it um, in order for it to stop. So, so you got to keep in mind, you're telling this stuff for the customer and for the users, and the users may not be employees or family or, or um, people who are aware of what's going on. They could be just one-time visitors. Um, and like I said, for a commercial uh, a situation, that's exactly what you've got. You've got people who are guests that are um, not aware of, of the situation of how these gate operators work. So we, uh, we got signage on the outside as well too. And uh, that pretty much completes the final step. Uh, we do uh, make sure that the customer is aware how to get a hold of us if we have service, if they have service. Um, and typically the best way to do that is to put a sticker on, side the, on the device that, um, that uh, needs to be serviced. And one of the things that we do is we actually have a whole list of stickers that we put on the equipment and we label it specifically what it is. So as an example, uh, if it's power, we label it power. Um, if it's a breaker, we label the breaker and put the number on it. If it's access control, we put access control on it. So when we're doing something and telling somebody, hey, that sticker that has a gate, the, the, the gate label on there, don't touch that. There's nothing that's user serviceable. Or hey, double check this emergency equipment and make sure that the light's not flashing or, or this, uh, this situation is not happening. Um, um, voice communication, hey, pick up the phone and actually see if you can hear a dial tone and if you hear a dial tone that means that uh, it's on our side if you don't hear a dial tone we're not the service provider you need to talk to them so make sure that not only the customer has the ability to contact you and ask what's going on but people who are not users people who are not regular users the 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 end user can tell the tell a, an, a new employee or a guest at their house, hey, look at the gate operator on there and it's got a sticker, call that number and they can take care of it. So we went through all those things with our customer as well too and um, just the basic operations of it and what they need to, uh, what they need to be aware of and the day-to-day -day functions of it. And then we allowed them to use it and we allowed them to do the manual release. It's one thing to talk about it, it's another thing to do it. So they need to be able to use the remote, they need to be able to use the manual release and uh, get used to using the equipment. So that about wraps this up. We, uh, we call this one a job complete, successful, done. Safety device is working. We've got a safe gate, operates quiet and, and it's nice and functional. And uh, we just move on to the next gate. So Safeguard Controls, Dallas, Texas. We do access control, audio, visual, visual video surveillance, and automatic gates and low voltage project management. Dallas, Texas, y'all.